The rights I am claiming are exercisable and guaranteed through my right to freedom of association from any democratic society or any obligations to the mutual benefit of others, and no restrictions may be placed on the exercise of these rights. The Constitution Act of Canada, 1982, Article 2, it says everyone has the following fundamental freedoms. Freedom of association. You can choose to associate with whom you want. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 22. Everyone has the right to freedom of association. So here we're seeing it. It is being expressed in international law, and then it's coming out through the Constitution Act of Canada, Article 2. Now, what international law that flows in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights places the obligation upon Canada to bring forth this right? What article of law is it? If you said Article 2.2, you would have been correct. So everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, freedom of association. Now in the Constitution Act of Canada, Article 7, it says everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Now these are positive rights. These are an expression of natural fundamental rights and freedoms. Now liberty would fall in, this, in line with association. You're free to associate with whom you want to associate. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada has already determined what the subject or player here of everyone refers to. It says, read as a whole, it appears that Section 7 was intended to confer protection on a singularly human level. A plain, common sense reading of the phrase, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, serves to underline the human element involved. Only human beings can enjoy these rights. Everyone, then, must be read in the light of the rest of the section and defined to exclude corporations and other artificial entities incapable of enjoying life, liberty, or security of the person and include only human beings. So when I read that article here just before where it says everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, this applies only for a human being, for a man or a woman. It doesn't apply for a class of person. It doesn't apply for uh, artificial entities or corporate bodies. This verse here in Article 7 is expressing your full legal capacity as an individual. As an individual, prior to the government ever existing, you had the ability to, to exercise your right to life, liberty, and security of your person. Looking into a couple of judgments, Olympia Interiors Limited versus Canada, Section 15 of the Charter, like Section 7, provides protection only to natural persons. The corporate plaintiff may not claim protection under this provision. Canada National Revenue versus Tanchfield. Persons are of two classes only, natural persons and legal persons. A natural person is a human being that has the capacity for rights or duties. Thus the definition proposed by Professor Yogis. A legal person is anything to which the law gives a legal or fictitious existence and personality with capacity for rights and duties. So a natural person, the designation of natural person, that can be charged with the fundamental rights and freedoms of a human being. Whenever you find an enactment the fact that there is a natural person being mentioned, that means that that designation, natural person, can take on the attributes, can be charged with the attributes, the rights and freedoms of the human being in order to express those rights and freedoms. Now, if it's not a natural person, if it's only a legal person, a class of person, not defined as natural, then it's only considered a corporate, a corporate artificial entity and it cannot express your fundamental rights and freedoms. So let me give you an example. Take McDonald's, the restaurant McDonald's. That's a legal person. That's an artificial entity in law, and it's a corporate body. We know that it has, a rest, it has restaurants, people go there and they eat, but it's a corporate body. Now, we couldn't charge the right to an adequate living into McDonald's. In the International Covenant, where we see that we have the right to the adequate living, well, McDonald's 
couldn't express the right to an adequate living because that right is not compatible with the nature of the legal person. You couldn't charge the fundamental right and freedom of the human being to have an adequate living into McDonald's. It's incompatible. McDonald's cannot express that type of right or freedom. Now, for example, the opposite of that, we know that McDonald's is a corporate body or any corporate body that is out there in existence in Canada. And what has transpired is that when you went to open up your corporation, they deemed you a director and placed you into the position of an officer operating an office in the corporate body of Canada. And that's the mechanism that they use to force a contribution uh, against you. Now there's international law says you have the right to be free and do what you want with your natural wealth. So therefore you could charge that right into the corporate body in order to exercise that right because it's compatible, but the right to an adequate living wouldn't be compatible. So what's important to note is that a natural person can be charged with the rights and freedoms of the human being in order to operate those rights and freedoms. Now, everyone represents a human being only in Article 7 of the Constitution Act. Corporate bodies cannot claim this protection and classes of persons cannot claim this protection. So, for example, when you operate as an officer in an office of Canada, you're, you're considered a corporate officer on behalf of the Corporation of Canada and you can't claim Section 7, Section 7 protection. If you're McDonald's, for example, and you're being sued, you can't go into court and say, well, I want to claim my Section 7 rights as a corporate body. It doesn't work. These rights are natural rights. If you go and look into a dictionary and look at the, the, the definition of a natural right, and I've done it in my other videos, but natural rights and inalienable rights, they give you a description of what it is. And then afterwards, they give you examples. And they always give you the example of life, liberty, and property life, liberty, and property, to express what a natural right is, what an inalienable right is. The human being into the natural person, you can charge a natural person with the rights or, or privileges that the human being has been granted or can stand under. Because there's difference that are going on. Rights and fundamental freedoms that operates apart from the society based upon the principle of mutual benefit. And privil privileges are something that you're granted within the society and for the society's benefit. So for example, Citizenship Act. Definitions in this act. Minister means such member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, as is designated by the Governor and Council as the minister for the purpose of this act. Rights and Obligations. A citizen, whether or not born in Canada, is entitled to all the rights, powers, and privileges, and is subject to all obligations, duties, and liabilities. We know the citizen is held under the oath of citizenship. I promise that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty, the Queen of Canada, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada. There's your obligations and your duties and your liabilities based upon the oath that you're taking. Now, citizenship, to be considered that class of person, that citizen, that's considered a privilege, not a right. Now, this court case stated, there is one fundamental principle of law, which is of paramount importance to the present case and on which both counsel agreed, undoubtedly, because it is so universally recognized not only by common law countries, but by all nations and from time immemorial. That principle is that citizenship is not a right, but a privilege. So to be associated with the crown, to be considered a citizen, to be considered under the crown in association with the crown, it's not a right that you can exercise, but a privilege that is granted to you. To be a Canadian citizen, it is a privilege given. It is not a right that can be exercised. We are given the status by force of a citizen, citizenship, by the way of our birth certificate. I am exercising my privilege and my fundamental freedom of association 
as a citizen of Canada. As a citizen, we have been granted the privilege to be in association with the Crown, to be part of the democratic society that the Crown has created. We also have the privilege to be controlled by the ministers of the Crown in our everyday life. As a citizen, the class of person, we have obligations and duties to the mutual benefit of others as a member of the society, the democratic society. I will no longer be recognized as a citizen through citizenship, which is a legal person who has obligations, duties, and liabilities to the mutual benefit of others as a member of the society under a civil law system. As such, I no longer have such obligations, duties, and liabilities to the mutual benefit of others as a member of that society. The rights and freedoms that I have claimed are in accordance with the due process of law and are in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, as I am not in association with any democratic society as a citizen or have any obligations or duties to other individuals or to the community as long as I no longer choose to belong to any association as a citizen. Now, this is not stating, and I'm not bringing forth the fact concerning our common law, which exactly if you steal or if you hurt one another, then you still have the right to face your uh, a judge, for example, and to be penalized by that common law. This is talking about statutory powers, enactments, rules, and regulations that are governing statutory creatures. Whereas autonomy, security of the person, is incompatible with society. Therefore, the government of Canada can no longer interfere with the rights I am claiming as they are not subject to, re to reasonable limits prescribed by law. We have the right to freedom of association. As a man or a woman, it's a fundamental right or freedom that we can exercise. If you will, it's a common law right that you have. And to be a citizen is a privilege to be in association with the crown to be a part of a mutual uh, society based upon the benefit of being together. That's a privilege, but you don't have to exercise that privilege. You don't have to use that privilege. When you invoke your right as a man or a woman to freedom of association, then you do not have to stand as a citizen under that class of person. I will not be associated as part of any democratic society or for any collective purpose to the mutual benefit of others as a citizen, that class of person. Therefore, I can no longer be held in servitude as a subject of Her Majesty and the Crown, being that the rights I am claiming are exercisable apart from any democratic society or any obligations to the mutual benefit of others. No restrictions may be placed on the exercise of these rights. What court case brings this forward? There's a specific court case. What I, what I just brought forth here is spoken about by a judge. It talks about our full legal capacity. And I'm going to read it in, in a few minutes here. But for those who follow me, I wonder how many people knew what court case it is. The right to the freedom of association, separate and apart from a democratic society, governed by government, is found within Section 1E of the Canadian Bill of Rights, Section 2D of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and Section 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as this right recognizes the qualitative difference between individuals, natural persons, and collectives, legal persons, but also gives constitutional protection to our claimed right to liberty and the security of the person apart from that democratic society. It should not be possible to force an individual standing in their full legal capacity outside statutory enactments to be associated with an organization that has been established pursuant to civil law. Now, in the court case here, it, uh, Kerr versus the Queen, that it is Section 2 of the Canadian Bill of Rights which gives force to Section 1. And he goes on to state that the crown is a symbol of free association of the members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. So the crown is supposed to be the symbol of free association. And to be associated with it as a citizen, it's a privilege. 
not a right, but a privilege that is given to you. However, if you choose not to associate with the crown by invoking your fundamental right and freedom to decide who you will associate with, then that's your right. You don't have to operate the privilege. The crown is the symbol of, of free association. This is a free and democratic society. I decide if I will associate with the crown or not. I owe no duty to the crown if I remain in my full legal capacity. Now, what is the preamble of the Constitution Act of Canada state? It says, whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and what? And the rule of law. How many know what this means when they state the rule of law? People might say, oh, well, the rule of law would say if I'm going 70 in the 50 kilometer zone, I just broke the law, so I'm breaking the rules of law. No, that's rules of law. Those are statutory enactments, uh, regulations. This is the rule of law. Thompson Newspaper Limited versus Canada. While individuals, as a rule, have full legal capacity by the operation of law alone, artificial persons, class of persons, the citizen, are creatures of the state and enjoy civil rights and powers only upon the approval of statutory authorities. The individual, the man or the woman, may stand upon his constitutional rights. He owes no duty to the state since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. His rights are such as existed by the law of the land long before antecedent to the organization of the state. This is the rule of law. This is our full legal capacity. We owe no duty to the state when we stand under our full legal capacity. We are not in association with the crown. We are not operating a privilege to be a citizen to stand in association with the crown. We owe no duty and the rights we are exercising, they have existed long before Canada became a dominion. That's the rule of law. That's our full legal capacity. And though we owe no duty to the state, the judge here says that the state still owes us a duty. And what is that? The protection of his life and property, which makes sense under common law, because no one can steal from me, no one can harm me. And if someone attempts to do so, then under common law, the state must protect me. Just like under common law, the state must, must leave me alone if I don't want to associate and operate a privilege to be with the crown. R versus Wagner, 2015. The idea that there are certain fundamental unwritten principles that govern all members of society, including legislators and which judges are expected to enforce, is not particularly new. The contemporary concept of unwritten constitutional principles can be seen as a modern reincarnation of the ancient doctrines of natural law. The judge is bringing up here the rule of law. What is Canada built upon? He's, he's bringing forth the fact that there are certain fundamental principles that govern the legislators and the judges are expected to enforce. And these principles fall under the doctrines of natural law. These principles that are to be enforced fall under our full legal capacity, which allows us to say we owe no duty to the state. We stand upon our rights, and these rights existed long before uh, the Dominion of Canada came to be. And you judges and legislators have the obligation to protect these rights and freedoms, not try to limit and abridge these rights and freedoms. Continuing on with R versus Wagner, finally at the developing fringes of the new natural law, which goes by the name of human rights. Thus, as important as these principles may be, and as essential as it may be, that in difficult cases, the judge must stand against the winds and the rains to uphold them, to uphold our human rights, to uphold our natural rights. Those unwritten principles 
tend to be largely replicated in the text of the Constitution with Section 7 of Canada's Charter of Rights striking me as a prime example. Our written Constitution reflects many, many influences, including the drafter's awareness of natural law. I agree with her that the rule of law is, apart from the terms of any written constitution, part of the constitutional DNA of this country, and that its precepts must be abided by and must be applied by judges, no matter how strong may be the prevailing winds or how challenging the social or political environment in which an issue arises. So Wagner saying here that the rule of law, which is taught us about our full legal capacity, that we have this by operation of law alone, and that we're not artificial creatures enjoying civil rights and powers uh, approved upon us by statutory authorities. We as individuals, we may stand on our constitutional rights and we owe no duty to the state. And our rights through natural law, through human rights, our rights have existed long before the dominion of Canada. And the legislators and the judges are expected to uphold our full legal capacity, not to try and trick us, not to try and place us into a class of person, into association with the crown under statutory powers, but to respect the principle that Canada is built upon, which is the rule of law. Rule of law, constitution, natural rights and freedoms must be respected and applied by the judge, no matter how much it affects the social or political environment. Department of Justice Act, Department Established. There is hereby established the Department of the Government of Canada, called the Department of Justice, over which the Minister of Justice, appointed by the Commission under the Great Seal, shall preside. Minister and Attorney General. This is the Department of Justice Act, and this is the statutory power. That's the enactment that was created. And it starts off by saying there is hereby established a Department of the Government of Canada. Okay, what does this mean, the Government of Canada? Where did this department have the right to establish itself? You should know if you watched my other videos. It comes out of the 1867 Constitution Act of Canada. Section 90 and 91. And the Canada that's being brought forth in the Constitution of 1867 is the federal juristic unit. It's the corporate body. So when they're talking about the government of Canada here, they're talking about the government of that corporate body, the executive powers of the corporate body. The minister is ex officio Her Majesty's Attorney General of Canada, holds office during pleasure, and has the management and direction of the department. So the Minister of Justice is also Her Majesty's Attorney General. He has a dual role, a dual capacity. Now powers, duties, and function of the minister. The minister is the official legal advisor of the Governor General and the legal member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and shall see that the administration of public affairs is in accordance with law. This is for the society based upon the principle of mutual benefit, the democratic society, when you are in free association with the crown. He has the obligation under this subsection here. He also has the superintendence of all matters connected with the administration of justice in Canada, not within the jurisdiction of the governments of the provinces. If you know what the administration of justice stands for, what that terminology means. It means upholding fundamental rights and freedoms, upholding our charter rights and freedoms, upholding our full legal capacity. So the minister, as attorney general, has been charged with the administration of justice in Canada. Attorney general, appointed under the great seal, is Her Majesty's attorney. He's the official legal advisor to the governor general. He has superintendence concerning the administration of justice. Now we're going to see exactly how deep this goes concerning the administration of justice. Again, if you've watched some of my other videos, you understand that when you're going to court and you're seeking the administration of justice, you have to notify the Attorney General within a certain time limit 
in order to have the court prepare itself to have the inherent jurisdiction, the common law jurisdiction. Well, here in the Department of Justice Act, Article 4.1, examination of bills and regulations. Subject to subsection 2, the minister shall, in accordance with such regulations, as may be prescribed by the governor and council, examine every regulation transmitted to the clerk of the Privy Council for registration pursuant to the Statutory Instrument Act and every bill introduced in or presented to the House of Commons by a Minister of the Crown in order to ascertain provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Minister shall report any such inconsistency to the House of Commons at the first convenient opportunity whether any of the provisions thereof are inconsistent with the purpose of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So as a minister, the Attorney General is under the duty to examine and to ascertain that every enactment and regulation, every law in Canada, is consistent with our full legal capacity, is consistent with the Constitution Act of Canada, 1982. So the Attorney General, the Minister of Justice, is signing off on the enactments and the regulations and he's reporting and claiming that they do not breach any of our fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, when you look at R versus HAPE, maybe you've heard that judgment in some of my other videos. And in R versus HAPE, it says that the judges in Canada are under the presumption that all statutory powers, all enactments, all regulations conform to international law. That's the presumption they're under. Well, the presumption is being built upon them or being placed upon them by this op operation of law here. Since the Attorney General examines the bills and he signs off on them and he says, yes, they are consistent with the Charter, they do not breach full legal capacity of individuals, then automatically when it's given force of law, the judges presume that the minister has done his duty and these enactments and regulations are not removing or limiting and abridging our fundamental rights and freedoms. That's why R versus HAPE taught us that. The judges are under presumption because the boss is signing off on the bills and saying everything is okay. The Attorney General is under the duty to make sure that the domestic law is consistent with the international obligations that Canada is under because of the covenants. This is why he must examine all statutes and regulations to make sure they are not violating the rule of law. The Charter is expressing the fundamental rights and freedoms of international law. The Veto versus Canada, another judgment. Canada's international obligations and relevant principles of international law are also instructive in defining the right. The content of Canada's international human rights obligation is, in my view, an important indice of the meaning of the full benefit of the Charter's protection. I believe that the Charter should generally be presumed to provide protection at least as great as that afforded by similar provisions in international human rights documents. Charest versus Canada. The inquiry into the principles of fundamental justice is informed not only by Canadian experience and jurisprudence, but also by international law, including Zhu Kojoin. This takes into account Canada's international obligations and values as expressed in the various sources of international human rights law, declarations, and covenants. Now, Nemeth versus Canada. I also accept, of course, that where possible, statutes, regulations, enactments should be interpreted in a way which make their provisions consistent with Canada's international treaty, obligations, and principles of international law. So the judges already know that Canada is under the obligation to allow us to exercise our full legal capacity. We saw uh, Wagner before laying into it and saying, listen, you got to stand for the rule of law. It doesn't matter the political or social pressure that's against you as a judge. Individuals have full legal capacity. They owe no duty to the state and you have to let them exercise their rights. And when the attorney general is examining these bills, he's signing off on them and he's allowing these uh, statutory powers to exist which creates limits and abridgments upon our full legal capacity, which are going against our charter rights and freedoms. The Department of Justice Act concerns the double role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. The prerogative common law executive powers 
and duties that have been charged and entrusted upon the Attorney General of Canada, and these are a law of Canada. The executive power must be exercised in a manner consistent with the rule of law, or the law of the land of Canada, by way or through the Constitution, concerning the exercise of my fundamental rights and freedoms. The Minister of Justice is a member of the Parliament. He's a member of the Queen's Privy Council, and he's the legal advisor to the executive. He's a representative of the Queen. He is also the Chief Executive Law Officer of the Privy Council and the Executive Council. The Minister is accountable for encroaching upon fundamental rights and freedoms. The powers and functions of the Attorney General of Canada were largely patterned upon those of the English Attorney General. As the legal and proper representative of the Crown, the holder of that office was vested with a number of wide common law powers. In the absence of any express provision of law, the Attorney General of Canada, by constitutional convention, is alone authorized to represent the Queen, as expressed within Section 12 of the Constitution Act of 1867. As we see in the Interpretation Act, Section 24.5, this power, these common law powers, may be exercised by the Attorney General if the duty is not being performed by the person for the time being charged with the execution of the powers and duties of the office. The Minister of the Government limits and abridges our rights and freedoms. The Attorney General, by constitutional powers, may exercise the powers of the Minister if the Minister fails to perform his duty. The Attorney General of Canada has been entrusted with all of the executive powers, both legislative and executive, and charged with the primary duties concerning the administration of justice, upholding the rule of law, upholding our full legal capacity, and also the guardian of public interest, the society based upon mutual benefit when we're in free association with the Crown. Attorney General, Executive Powers, is a guardian of common law through the administration of justice. The Attorney General, through Executive Powers, is the guardian of the public interest. The Attorney General, through legislative powers, makes sure enactments are consistent. As we've seen before in Article 4.1 of the Justice Act, he has to make sure these enactments and regulations are not limiting and abridging our charter rights and freedoms. The Attorney General of Canada must act under the laws of Canada, which are privileges and powers that have been accorded to the Crown, the Attorney General of Canada, by the common law, in respect of the executive powers that are to be exercised to give effect to my rights in order to cancel my obligations and privileges as a citizen. The Minister of Justice is Her Majesty's Attorney General, is the Chief Law Officer for Her Majesty. The office was appointed under the Great Seal of Canada, and the primary duties is to the administration of justice concerning the rule of law. And those duties include, but are not limited to, this operation of law here, where the Attorney General of Canada, the Minister of Justice, was under obligation to verify all enactments and regulations that are given, are, are about to be given force of law here in Canada to make sure they're not limiting and abridging our charter rights and fundamental freedoms as part of that rule of law. Looking into Thompson Limited versus Canada, again, while individuals as a rule have full legal capacity by operation of law alone. Artificial persons are creatures of the state and enjoy civil rights and powers only upon the approval of statutory authorities. The individual may stand upon his constitutional rights. He owes no duty to the state. Our fundamental rights and freedoms, they operate by rule of law, by law alone, and we have our full legal capacity. Our fundamental rights and freedoms do not come to us through statutory powers, do not come to us through enactments and regulations. So we should see the similar power, similar attributes concerning how to enforce our full legal capacity. So when you look at this Corolla versus Minister of National Revenue, it says the term inherent jurisdiction is one that is commonly and not always accurately used when arguments are made with respect to the jurisdictional basis 
upon which a court is asked to make a particular order. The inherent jurisdiction of a superior court is derived not from any statute or rule of law, but from the very nature of the court as a superior court. Macmillan, Rodell Limited versus Simpson. The jurisdiction to exercise these powers was derived not from any statute or, or rule of law, meaning rules of law, not the rule of law, but from the very nature of the court as a superior court of law. And for this reason, such jurisdiction has been called inherent. Now, discussing the history of inherent jurisdiction, Jake, Jacob says, the superior courts of common law have exercised the power which has come to be called the inherent jurisdiction from the earliest times. So just like our fundamental rights and freedoms are not dependent upon statutory powers, the inherent jurisdiction of the courts, of the superior court, to enforce our full legal capacity is not dependent upon any statute or rules of law. The Canadian Bill of Rights An Act for the Recognition and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms Preamble The Parliament of Canada affirming that the Canadian nation is founded upon the principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God, the dignity and worth of the human person, and the position of the family in a society of free men and free institutions, affirming also that men and institutions remain free only when freedom is founded upon respect for moral and spiritual values and the rule of law. So such a society of free men and free institutions, this society remains free when it's built upon the respect of the rule of law. And being desirous for enshrining these principles and the human rights and fundamental freedoms derived from them in a Bill of Rights, which shall reflect the respect of Parliament for its constitutional authority and which shall ensure the protection of these rights and freedoms in Canada. So the Crown is a symbol of free association. It's supposed to be a society based upon free choice of men and women to enter into the society. And this society follows the rule of law, which says that if you choose not to be part of it, then you have every right to stand under your fundamental rights and freedoms of association and say, I do not want to be held or operate a privilege of citizenship for the, and be part of the society of mutual benefit. Society is built upon free men and free institutions. Freedom is found and built upon the rule of law. The rule of law says that we have full legal capacity and owe no duty to the state. Our rights exist long before the Dominion of Canada and they flow or flow, follow through the common law. Canadian Bill of Rights. It is hereby recognized and declared that in Canada there have existed and shall continue to exist without discrimination by reason of race, national origin, color, religion, or sex, the following human rights and fundamental freedoms, namely the right of the person, it's not what it says, right, individual, both capacities, the right of the individual to life, liberty, security of the person, and enjoyment of property, and the right not to be deprived thereof except by due process of law. This falls in line with the Constitution Act of Canada, Article 7. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Natural right, a right that is conceived as part of natural law and that is therefore thought to exist independently of rights created by the government or society, such as the right to life, liberty, and property. So you and I, as men and women, the rule of law says that we have rights that exist independent of the government, not created by the government. They existed long before the Dominion of Canada and the government must respect our fundamental rights and freedoms, our natural rights. It is recognized and declared in Canada that natural rights, fundamental human rights, existed and shall continue to exist in Canada. This is the rule of law, the very foundation of law in Canada.
in the Bill of Rights, it is recognized that individuals have the right to freedom of assembly and freedom of association. This interconnects with the Constitution Act of Canada, Article 2, where it says everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, the freedom of association. So as a man or a woman, under your full legal capacity, you have the right to freedom of association, and you've always have had that right. It is not something that the government has created. It is not something that a statutory enactment has brought forth. This is part of your common law right. Now, in the Bill of Rights, it says every law of Canada shall be so construed and applied as to not abrogate, abridge, or infringe, or to authorize the abrogation, abridgment, or infringement of any of the rights or freedoms herein recognized and declared. So they're not allowed to use a statutory power in order to limit and abridge your full legal capacity. And what judgment from the courts of Canada declares this? You've seen it on my other videos, where it says that you cannot point to domestic law to abridge and limit charter rights or international rights. Zinger versus the Queen. The law in Canada must be constructed so it does not limit or abridge our full legal capacity. So it does not limit or abridge our fundamental rights. The legislative authority must not limit or abridge our rights. This includes the Attorney General of Canada. So the Bill of Rights is declaring it, that no law is allowed to limit or abridge our fundamental rights and freedoms. We see in the Department of Justice Act in Article 4.1, before it becomes law, before it becomes domestic law, the Attorney General is supposed to be making sure that there's no limit or abridgment taking place against our full legal capacity. Parliament, legislators, and the executive powers have declared through the domestic law that it is, express, it is the express will of Canada that the rule of law be not broken, that the intention is to give full and adequate effect to our fundamental rights and freedoms. The Constitution Act of Canada, 1982. Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God, and the rule of law. Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the rule of law, that recognize our full legal capacity. No law of Canada is allowed to breach the rule of law. Now, when you look at the Guarantee of Rights and Freedoms, Article 1, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So what is the factor? What is the principle? What is the mechanism that they can use to try and limit and abridge your fundamental rights and freedoms? They can limit and abridge rights and freedoms in the free and democratic society. When you're not part of that free and democratic society, operating the privilege of citizenship in association with the crown, then there's no limit that can be placed upon your rights and freedoms. The fundamental freedoms, Article 2, everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, freedom of association. Article 7, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So you have the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and you cannot be deprived of these rights except if it's in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So you want to take on the role of the class of person, the citizen, operate that privilege, then you take yourself out of your full legal capacity, and you're now operating as a statutory creature, operating duties and civil obligations as that statutory creature. Liberty, freedom from arbitrary or undue external restraint, especially by a government. The opposite of servitude, as a citizen, privileges, guarantees liberty. The crown is a symbol of free association. So remember that. The, the privilege of being a citizen puts you into association with the crown, 
into a society based upon the principle of mutual benefit. And in that, in that society, your rights and freedoms now are subject to limitations and abridgments, and you are no longer considered a man or a woman under your full legal capacity, but you are operating as a class of person who is limited and depending on what you are doing. So you're a class of person, you're the driver. You're the class of person, you're the student. You're the class of person, you're the taxpayer. You're the class of person, you're the patient in the hospital. Everything that you're doing now becomes a statutory power that controls the actions over you. You lose your full legal capacity. Now, the crown, Canada, is built upon free association. The crown is the symbol of free association. It is our fundamental right to decide if we will associate with the crown. This is the rule of law. This is the law of Canada. Enforcement of guaranteed rights and freedoms. In the Constitution Act of Canada, Article 24, it says anyone whose rights or freedoms, as guaranteed by this charter, have been infringed or denied, may apply to a court of competent jurisdiction to obtain such remedy as the court considers appropriate and just in circumstances. So when they try to force you to operate your privilege into citizenship and be in association with the crown to limit your full legal capacity, when they try to say that you owe a duty to the state when you're standing under your full legal capacity, that's a limitation, an infringement, and deny, denial of your fundamental rights and freedoms. And remember, the Bill of Rights says nothing in the Bill of Rights, Part 1, shall be construed to abrogate or abridge any human right or fundamental freedom that is not enumerated therein that may have existed in Canada at the commencement of this Act, which ties in with the Constitution Act, Article 26, where it says a guarantee in this Charter of certain rights and freedoms shall not be construed as denying the existence of any other rights or freedoms that exist in Canada. Under your full legal capacity, you have a lot more um, rights that you can exercise besides the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, or, or life, liberty, and property. But these are the three main ones that most people and most individuals are affected with directly once they enter into the society based upon the principle of mutual benefit. Because what happens is the first thing in that society is you lose your fundamental right to property. You lose your right to ownership, absolute ownership to your property. Your property through their statutory powers, as I have shown you in other videos, are, 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 is being subjected to uh, control and administration by the government powers. They claim absolute title over your property and they give to you a qualified title and they administer your property, and they say what you can and cannot do with your property. That's an infringement and a, an abridgment of your fundamental rights and freedoms. But because you're in that society operating for the mutual benefit together, they say you, they're allowed to do that to you. Remember that society is defined as such. A community of people as of a state or nation or locality with common cultures, traditions, and interests. An association or company of persons united by mutual consent to deliberate, determine, and act jointly for a common purpose. Canadian society, Kingdom of the Crown, is an association united by mutual consent through free association. And this is done based upon the rule of law. Declaratory statute one enacted for the purpose of removing doubts or putting an end to conflicting decisions in regard to what the law is in relation to a particular matter. It may either be expressive of the common law or may declare what shall be taken to be the true meaning and intention of a previous statute. A statute enacted to put an end to a doubt as to what is the common law or the meaning of another statute and which declares what it is and ever has been, that which clearly defines rights to be observed and wrongs to be eschewed. Can Canadian Bill of Rights, in accordance with the Constitution, is a declaratory statute, which is declaring, expressing the rule of law. 
as it pertains to our full legal capacity. Citizens are members of a community based on mutual consent. Individuals are assured through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that the association to the Canadian society is based upon choice. Canada is founded upon the principle of the rule of law and you need not associate with the Crown at all. The ministers of the Crown, the Attorney General can act on their behalf for the enforcement of the administration of justice. If the minister fails in his obligation to the rule of law, ministers of the Crown, they must respect the rule of law. It's a duty and an obligation upon them. The Supreme Court of Canada held that freedom from compelled association is, in certain circumstances, included within the guarantee of freedom of association in Section 2D of the Charter. However, Section 2D cannot have been intended to protect persons, notice that, persons, against activity which is an inevitable part of membership in a democratic society. As an individual human being, standing under your full legal capacity, you have the common law right to decide if you will associate with the Crown and the free democratic society. How do they do that to you? They make you or they give, give you the privilege to operate as a citizen. And by operating that privilege, now you are in association with the Crown and in the society for the mutual benefit of others. But as an individual, you don't have to operate in that association. As a citizen, you are designated a class of person which owes duties and obligations because of the membership, your association to the Crown. As a citizen, you cannot invoke freedom of association to stop paying taxes. You are obligated as a member of the society to follow the rules. The individual, under the rule of law, takes recognition as a citizen is a member of the society based upon the mutual benefit, must associate with the Crown and all of its members. The individual, under the rule of law, has no obligation to associate with the Crown or the Government of Canada. Citizenship is a privilege, not a right. Associate with the free Crown is a privilege. Associate with the free democratic society is a privilege. As an individual, you do not have to use or operate the privilege being offered to you. Freedom of association operates as a rule of law. Citizen enters into association with the Crown, becomes a member of the free democratic society. Freedom of association may be limited for the greater good of that society. Individual, human being, standing under their full legal capacity, no restriction or limitation can be placed upon this right. Why? Because you have this right long before Canada became a dominion. It's a natural, fundamental human right that you have that you decide who you will associate with. That is part of the rule of law. And if you make that decision, Canada, the executive powers, the attorney general, is under obligation to respect that decision. There are several offices of Canada where the officers and officials working in these offices think or take the position that public law, the society, based upon the principle of mutual benefit, is of primary importance and is of the uttermost importance. In R versus Haynes, we said prior to the Charter's advent, the individual really had no special means of protecting against incursions upon his or her basic fundamental rights by executive or legislative arm of the state. There were no means at the disposal of individuals to muster court challenges aimed at invalidating legislative, executive, or administrative acts. The rule of law stated in the con through the Constitution that it hinges the existence of public order and it mandated compliance with directives and ordinances it mandated compliance with enactments and regulations, even if they infringed upon individual fundamental rights and freedoms. A primary purpose of the Charter was to change this relationship of the individual 
with the state and its laws by endowing individuals with an effective means of challenging acts of the state in courts on the ground of violation of their constitutionally protected rights and freedoms. Prior to the advent of the Charter, public law was of primary. Public law ruled, and individuals were expected to surrender some of their fundamental rights and freedoms for the betterment of the society based upon the mutual benefit. Since the advent of the Charter, this has changed. The rule of law is clear. A man or a woman owes no duty to the state. His rights and freedoms existed long before the Dominion of Canada, and the Dominion of Canada is under obligation to respect those fundamental rights and freedoms. The rule of law brings forth that individual rights and freedoms are above the society based upon mutual benefit. The Crown, through the Attorney General, must protect your full legal capacity, must protect the rule of law. This is not a show. This is an obligation upon them. That's why in their own enactments, he's under the responsibility to verify each and every statutory power, statutory instrument that comes through his office before he signs off on them to make sure they're not limiting and abridging our fundamental rights and freedoms. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms Examination Regulations Her Excellency the Governor-General and Council, on the recommendation of the Minister of Justice, pursuant to Section 4.1, the Department of Justice Act, is pleased to hereby make an annex regulations respecting the examination of bills and regulations pursuant to the Department of Justice Act. In the case of every bill introduced in or presented to the House of Commons by a Minister of the Crown, the Minister shall, forthwith, on receipt of two copies of the bill from the Clerk of the House of Commons, examine the bill in order to determine when he, whether any of the portions or provisions thereof are inconsistent with the purpose and provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and cause to be affixed to each of the copies thereof so received from the Clerk of the House of Commons a certificate in the form approved by the Minister and signed signed by the Deputy Minister Justice, stating that the bill has been examined as required by Section 4.1 of the Department of Justice Act. The Minister, the Attorney General, has the duty to examine the statutes and regulations in order to determine if the statute and regulation do not violate the rights and freedoms protected and recognized in the Constitution under the rule of law. Now he makes a report and the Deputy Attorney General has to sign upon it and say it is conforming. There is the legal accountability, there is the legal liability against them, against that office. The statutes and regulations cannot limit or abridge existing rights and freedoms. In no way, in no case, may the statutes limit or abridge the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, our full legal capacity. They cannot force you to obey statutory instruments that breach the rule of law. Jump into the Interpretation Act of Canada, Article 42.1. Power of repeal or amendment reserved. Every act shall be so construed as to reserve to Parliament the power of repealing or amending it, and revoking, restricting, or modifying any power, privilege, or advantage thereby vested in or granted to any person. Section 42 of the Interpretation Act of Canada evidences the express restriction of my claimed rights and freedoms, the obstruction of the rule of law, the laws of the land of Canada, and the resulting tort of trespass upon my person and existing fundamental rights and freedoms. Within the Interpretation Act, and this is subsequently in each province, they cre created a statutory instrument, a statutory power that allowed them or gave them the power to revoke, restrict, or modify any power, privilege, or advantage 
that was vested in or granted to any person. Interpretation Act of Canada reserves the right of Parliament to restrict or modify any power, privilege, or advantage vested or granted to any person. Needless to say, they're not allowed to do this. This is a complete breach of the rule of law. They cannot use a statutory instrument to try and remove our full legal capacity. And this is against Her Majesty for doing this. Canada, the Attorney General versus Newfield Seeds Limited. As a starting point, the Attorney General contends that Section 9 of the Constitution Act of 1867 vests in Her Majesty the Queen, a physical person, to whom the laws of agency or mandate apply. When ministers or other government officers act on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen within the scope of their authority or apparent, they can bind the crown. So when the ministers and the government officers act on behalf of her, the Queen, they are binding the crown. When they try to use a power to restrict or modify whatever fundamental right and freedom you are seeking to exercise, they are binding the crown. Her Majesty, a physical person, head of Canada, head of the crown. The ministers serve her in free association and their actions they bind the crown. The Privy Council for Her Majesty granted the Chief Executive Officer all powers and authorities belonging to the Privy Council in respect of Canada. This, this includes respecting the rule of law. Under the Constitution Act of 1867, the Queen and her representative, the Attorney General of Canada, is expressly included in the legislative process. It is clear that the Attorney General is the representative of the Queen, as expressed within Section 10 of the Constitution, as the other Chief Executive Officer. The Governor General is operating all powers that have been granted to his office from the other Chief Executive Officer, the Attorney General of Canada. The Attorney General is the head of everything, and he must respect the rule of law concerning our full legal capacity. The Attorney General, the Governor General, grants powers to the ministers through statutes. The public officers represent the ministers, and they perform the duties of the ministers. R versus Sharma, the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed this principle. Thus, where the exercise of a discretionary power is entrusted to a minister of the Crown, so the Attorney General, the Governor General, transfers the power to the Minister of the Crown, it may be presumed that the, that the acts will be performed not by the Minister in person, but by the responsible officials in his department. So, the powers that are being operated in the government offices, the power that's being transferred to the Minister, is not really the Minister that's operating the power, but the public officials and officers in that office. Public officials and officers represent the Crown. The powers they are operating under flow from the Minister. These powers are executive in nature. The Cabinet, the public, official, public officials, also must respect the rule of law and the obligations that rest upon the Crown. The Queen versus Harrison. Although there is a general rule of construction in law, that a person endowed with a discretionary power should exercise it personally, that rule can be displaced by the language, scope, or object of a particular administrative scheme. Where the exercise of a discretionary power is entrusted to a minister of the crown, it may be presumed that the acts will be performed not by the minister in person, but by responsible officials in his department. The tasks of the minister of the crown in modern times are so many and varied that it is unreasonable to expect them to be performed personally. So even though we have the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Revenue, the Minister of Public Security, the Minister has been granted the power, his office has been granted the power from the Chief Executive Officer, but the ones who are performing on his behalf 
will be the officers and officials, and they're accountable to respect the rule of law. Slate Communications taught us that, and we'll get into that more after. The public officers are operating the powers of the minister, and every officer must respect the rule of law or full legal capacity. When Section 52 of the Constitution Act of 1982 declares that the Constitution of Canada, which includes the Charter, is supreme over any law that is inconsistent with it, the term law is meant to encompass and include every type of law that regulates people's lives. It includes statute law, common law, regulations, and any other binding legal norms, including municipal bylaws. Any laws that are limiting or abridging the rule of law our full legal capacity is of no force or effect and the attorney general should have realized this and taken action when he was examining the statutes prior to them having force of law slate communications the reference in section 32 to the parliament and the legislator make clear that the charter operates as a limitation on the powers of those legislative bodies any statute enacted by either parliament or a legislator would, which is inconsistent with the charter will be outside the power, the enacting body, and will be invalid. It follows that any body exercising statutory authority, for example, the governor and council, or lieutenant governor and council, ministers, officials, municipalities, school boards, universities, administrative tribunals, and police officers are also bound by the charter. An action taken under these statutory authorities is valid only if it is within the scope of the authority. Since neither body can authorize action which would be in breach of the Charter, thus the limitation on statutory authority which are imposed by the Charter will flow down the chain of statutory authority and apply to the regulations, bylaws, orders, decisions, and all other action whether legislative, administrative, or judicial, which depends for its validity on statutory authority. So here the judge is clearly saying that the enactments, the regulations that govern all of these positions, they are not allowed to be breaching and limiting our full legal capacity. They are not allowed to be breaching the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And any action of these public officials, these officers who are operating as we just learned, on behalf of the ministers, their actions are not allowed to be limiting and abridging our full legal capacity. All of the Crown is subject to the rule of law. Ministers, public officials, and public officers. Any action they take must not breach the rule of law, must not breach our full legal capacity. They must leave us alone to exercise our rights. Freedom imports in the words of the author of Solment on Jurisprudence, 12th edition at page 235, a sphere of activity within which the law is content to simply leave me alone. When the Crown, the ministers, the public officials breach the rule of law, they have committed a tort upon us. When we understand that the enactments that they are claiming we have a duty to have violated the rule of law, the Attorney General becomes accountable to you personally why? Because, remember, he examined those bills, and he signed off on those statutory powers. And he said, those statutory powers are not breaching the rule of law here in Canada. Those statutory powers allow a man or a woman to stand under their full legal capacity and exercise their fundamental rights and freedoms, as expressed in international law, as expressed in the Bill of Rights, as expressed in the Constitution of Canada of 1982. They create a tort against us. This is a legal wrong committed upon us. It's a direct invasion of our legal right of, our, of, of the individual. It's a direct invasion of our full legal capacity to force us to obey a statutory power that limits and abridges our charter rights. R versus Advanced Cutting and Corning Limited. Negative rights are viewed as individual rights, embodying individual goals. An individual is given the constitutional right not to belong to an association. The freedom of association 
guaranteed by Section 2D of the Charter encompasses a negative right to be free from compelled association. He goes on to say the infringement of Section 2D is not justifiable in this case. But you're understanding the operation and the concept of law here. No one, the individual, the human being, cannot be forced into compelled association. That's why citizenship is a privilege. That's why you have to associate with the crown in order to be part of that democratic society. The, ju the judiciary has declared that an individual has a constitutional right not to have to associate with the free association of the crown, nor do we have to operate the privilege granted to us to enter into recognition as a class of person in order to participate, have membership in the free democratic society. In R versus Hape, it states it is a well-established principle of statutory interpretation that legislation will be presumed to conform to international law. The Queen's courts are to presume that all legislation in Canada conforms both to constitutional and to international law. And why is that? We talked about it at the beginning of the video, because of the fact that the Attorney General is signing off on the statutes and regulations, declaring that they are conforming to the rule of law. And he is placing the courts and the judges under the presumption that the enactments conform to the rule of law. The Queen's courts are to presume that all legislations conform to the rule of law. This standing, this ground of the court, is a byproduct of the failure of the Attorney General to perform his duties when verifying the statutes and enactments that the legislative bodies seek to implement. The Attorney General was charged with the duty to not allow statutes into operation which limit or abridge our fundamental rights and freedoms. The court automatically assumes the Minister of Justice has performed his duty and the enactment is valid. We must prove that the Attorney General failed in his duty and that we are being forced into association to obey the laws of Canada. As the court state, there is a presumption that the Attorney General will carry out her duties in good faith, which is supported by the common law, legislation, policy, and constitutional convention. Canada Attorney General versus Saskatchewan Water Corporation. It is of primary constitutional importance that ministers should not be confused with the Crown. All the ordinary powers of the government, subject to the relatively few exceptions, are conferred by statute upon ministers, in their own names and not upon the Crown. The ministers are, of course, servants of the Crown, and exercise their powers as such, but they have never enjoyed the Crown's immunities. You don't have the Queen's protection, ministers. The practice of granting powers to the ministers rather than to the Crown has the great virtue that it prevents the Crown's immunities from obstructing the operation of the rule of law and the effectiveness of remedies against the state. All are servants of the Crown and not one another. Only those who specifically ordered or committed the wrong are legally liable as principals together with the crown as employer. Where an act confers power on a minister directly, he is liable to the legal remedies as countless cases illustrate. His officers act as his alter ego, as explained in Cartonella Limited versus Commissioners of Work. But since the only person who can legally exercise the power is the minister, it is he, and he only, who must answer for the legality of his action. When the officers and the officials who operate on behalf of the minister breach the rule of law and take actions against your fundamental rights and freedoms, which is slate communications that court judgment said they're not supposed to do it, it's the minister who becomes responsible. And when you go higher on the chain, it's the Attorney General of Canada as Chief Executive Officer who becomes accountable because he delegated his power to these other ministers. Ministers are servants of the Crown. The public officials operate the powers on behalf of the ministers. 
but only the ministers legally operate the powers of the crown. It is the ministers that must be held accountable for violating the rule of law. When any officer of Canada is seeking to hold us in servitude, is seeking to claim that we have a duty to the enactments, this is a breach of the rule of law. If a public official violates our full legal capacity, it is the minister that is to be held responsible for, she, for he or she is the minister of the crown and they have the obligation to respect our full legal capacity, to respect the rule of law and to simply leave us alone.